Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started with the second half of session nine. Let me get the screen up for you guys. Next is we're going to say, let's go ahead and use this idea of dot products to go through and look at how we can uh, put some normals on our different panels and then evaluate those in terms of how strong the normal is in terms of its position relative to the sun. And we have an example for you, 9.3, which sort of looks like this. I'm going to give you an overview of where we're going to do with it. We're going to basically going to put some normals on these panels. And there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Yeah. We can go ahead and go through and create surfaces from the quad points. So we have all these different quad points. What we'd like to do is basically create a surface from the four different points. Okay. And then uh, from those points, uh, go through and figure out what the normal is you know, at the middle of that surface. The other way we can do it is we can say, let's create a best fit plane from the quad points. And there's a very subtle difference to why you'd want one versus the other, but let me kind of like illustrate that real quickly. If you, for example, had like four points that were sort of representing uh, some points on a surface, but the surface itself is actually a little curvaceous. So if you have a curvy surface, Something that has a little, actually that's not a very good one right there. And do that one. If you have a curving surface, something that has a little bit of curvature to it, okay, and I go through and I say, let's go ahead and think about the normals. Here's what I can do. If I have that surface and I say, let's go ahead and go to the point which is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 in both directions on that surface, so right in the center of it, okay, give myself a nice point right here, and then do the normal to it, okay, that'll be fairly accurate, that'll be fairly good. If I go through and instead say, no, what I really want to do is, as opposed to working with the surface itself, Let's go through and just connect those points with a best fit plane, okay? And then go through and put the normal from that. Chances are they're going to be very, very close to each other. The surface will be a little bit more accurate, especially if you have something that has a lot of curvature to it than the best fit plane. Because the best fit plane is really only as good as the fineness of the points you give it. So, you know, if you have a very wide grid, um, you can lose a lot of information. So surfaces are always a little bit better. They follow the true curvature. Okay, but either way sort of works out. We're going to go through and kind of show you how to do it both that way, both ways. But what we're going to do is we're going to basically put some surfaces, some normals off the surfaces. We're going to go ahead and take care of a very funny problem that happens just with the way the math works within Dynamo. And it's a little hard to predict, but I know how to work around the problem. And the problem is this. When you go through and you put the normal, okay, you think you know which way the normal's going. Every once in a while, and it's very hard to predict, Revit will do that, where the normals will be flipped. Okay? And it's really hard to say why. It's, they show up sometimes doing exactly what you expect, and sometimes they flip themselves. Okay? But what we can do is, based on our knowledge of the surface, look for anything that is flipped, and if it's flipped, flip it back okay, to try and get the right direction. So just watch out for that. That's something that actually happens. It's just kind of this weird thing about Dynamo. It has a lot to do with the direction of the curves you draw. And if you draw them left to right or top to bottom, and if you flip curves. But it's not 100% predictable. And this is something that we play around with every quarter. 
and it's almost easier to sort of figure out here's the fix to the problem as opposed to really trying to say it's it's nothing you're doing. It's just in the math and the way they're computing it. So I think there's a little bit of inconsistency in the way they do that. What we're going to do is potentially do a little flipping. And for flipping, what I tend to do is come up with some little functions that'll do things like, for example, if you know that you think of the outer as being everything that point upward, okay, we create a little custom node called all nodes point upward. And what happens is for every vector, it says, hey, if your z value is less than zero, I'm just going to flip your z. I'm going to point you up instead. I'm actually going to flip you in all directions. If I take the director directions x, y, and z, and I multiply them all by negative 1, it was flip the vector inside out. Okay. So all points upward is actually a pretty good note. It takes care of a lot of what we do. Uh, another note we do sometimes called all points outward, which is for cases where you sort of think of where the inner part of it is, the center is, and sometimes you have surfaces which are below that center. So it's like inside, outside versus upward. Upward's a pretty good approximation for most of what we're doing. But outward works pretty well too. Okay, so we're going to do a little fixing to that. Once we go through and put our normal vectors on, we're going to say, let's go through and do a vector to the sun. Sun settings current and sun direction gives us the vector to it. Then we're going to normalize it. That's just so we get a length of 1 as opposed to a length of 100. Then we're going to dot product them. Okay, and the larger dot product, well, actually, oh, close to zero, larger dot product. Watch what I say right there, because that's what it makes me do think about whether it's zero or one. Generally, one is very good in terms of what you're doing in there. All right, that's closer to zero, larger dot product. That's, it's confusing the way it's written right there. Yeah, you just take out the large dot product, right? It's just closer to zero. What is the large dot I think that would actually read correctly. Okay, now okay, hang on. Okay, hang on. Let's do this. It's really a large dot product. Means that the okay, vector closer aligned to sun, so panel is closer to perpendicular. Okay, I think that's probably the easiest way to explain it. But again, it sort of makes more sense when you actually see it. Okay. That's the roadmap for what we're going on. So let's go ahead and open up, I think it's 9.3, and take a look at this. We're going to start by just going through and computing these orientations. As soon as we compute these orientations, there's all sorts of stuff we can do. We can take based on the strength and map it to a color range. So very strongly aligned is red, and weakly aligned is blue, or we can change uh, parameters about the panels, any of those things. But it all starts by just doing a little evaluation. So if you can, come on over to 9.3. And let's see what we can find. So I imagine it's going to look very similar to the last uh, surface. A little bit of updating action on my end. A lot of regenerating. This opens and it find, uh, regenerates. Open up the Dynamo file, and you'll see the beginning of the script is very similar to what we've been doing in the past. It's really just taking a surface, selecting a surface, and quieting the surface. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, I got a surface. It's got some panels on it. Looks amazingly like the last surface. Okay, and in terms of working on this, if you want to, go ahead and show the sun right now. Let's see what the sun settings are saying right now. Sun settings. What do I got? I'm in Boston. 
Looks like I'm still there. I'll make it in June. Okay, you might see ever so subtly on the surface, you can sort of see the brightness. These again are all gray, but they're shaded, so it's giving you some sense of really what it considers to be brightness based on the sun's position. And if you want to, you can show the sun's position. Say sun path on. And you can sort of see the sun over there. Kind of doing its thing. Okay, with this in place, let me kind of pan that over a little bit. Let's go ahead and regenerate those panels. A yeah, good thing to do that's probably the safest thing is to go through and eliminate the panels and regenerate them. So if you highlight them all, what I sometimes have to do is I don't want to eliminate the surface too. I'm just going to get the curtain panels. That looks good. I'm just going to get rid of them for right now just because it looks like my mask was hidden. Uh, I want to go through and make sure that Dynamo is pointing to those panels, not some other mystery panels that are left over. So I'm going to say add in, it's going to open up the Dynamo script, and we will start just by uh, kind of figuring out these surface normals. Let me open up 9.3, let's start with step 1A. Okay, so again, what should be happening over here is, let's go ahead and run this and see. I got some surface there, I got a lot of panels on it. Let's talk about what that, the script actually looks like, because it's a little interesting. It looks like something's a little odd. Let's see what's going on here. I have, I'm selecting a face, that looks pretty good. I'm saying, let's go ahead and take a certain number of panels in each row, and numbers of columns, that's kind of okay. And the rectangular seamless panel. What I actually have going on here is I have a custom node. This is a custom node that really encapsulates a lot of that functionality that we've been working on again and again and again. Let's just kind of take a look at what's inside that custom node because, you know, as I said, we're going to keep on doing that same thing over and over again. Let's open that up and kind of take a look. What I'm feeding it is a number of rows and numbers of columns, and I should hopefully be getting back some adaptive components. It looks like I'm not right now. I got a lot of nulls in there. So let's see if we can figure out why that is, because something's not working, right? Let's edit the custom node and see. Inside, I'm feeding the number of rows and columns. That looks pretty good. I got a surface over here. That's OK. I'm going to say surface point at parameter. Okay. This should basically go through and give me all of those different quad points. I'm going to flatten those out. I'm going to quad them. And I think it actually is, it's right there. I think my flattening right there is probably where my trouble is. Because if I remember, this function has changed a little bit. Let's talk about how we can sort of really explore this. The deal is, Inside of this custom node, we have a hard time seeing what's actually going on. We know that the tail end is not looking right. We know the tail end of this function sort of says quad points, but that's giving me some nulls. The adaptive component looks like it's giving me some nulls. So I know it broke somewhere along the way. I'm trying to figure out why it's breaking along the way. So here's what you can do. We don't have the little preview here, but what you can do is actually put a watch inside your node. And let me rerun this. Now, when I'm running, I can't run inside the custom node. What I have to do is actually go back over here to the higher level. And I'll run it again. But when I get a bunch of nulls like that, that usually means something's just messing around inside the node. Let's just kind of take a look at it and figure it out.
Looks like actually, it's interesting. It looks like I do have quad points. Let's see what's happening with my adaptive components. Actually looks okay. What's happening is I have a list with all those in there. I had to flatten out the list. That's so that I remove the outer level. And what's happening over here? Somehow this adaptive component, this doesn't seem like it's actually delivering a list of components. It's interesting over there, it kind of looks good. Let's see what's happening over here is this family symbol. Hmm, but this thing over here is returning a bunch of nulls right now. What I'm going to do, again, in the spirit of debugging, is just put another watch in here. Although, I can see what's going on because it's returning that result of the adaptive components. And it says there are a bunch of nulls right now, and that's the part that sort of confuses me right now. Actually, it's a list of nulls. Okay. I could tell a little about what's going on because I would expect that to actually be a single list and I got a list of lists right now. So there's something kind of messed up in there. Let's go back and see if we can debug that. So over here, if I take this watch, let's run that. We'll figure this out. Is it just me, or do you have the same problem? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. The family right. types? Quads from rectangular grid is, is working well. That's good. Quads. Yeah. But adaptive component is not. Yeah. Let's see if we can figure it out. After, after quads, you don't need the this one anymore. Yeah. Okay, let me go back over. <clears throat> so over here, after I quad it. Yeah, the last flatten can go. That flatten can go? Yeah. Because that quad is already quadded. OK. Let's try that in terms of the adaptive component by points. So I'm taking that one out. OK, let's try that. At least in terms of the placement of the adaptive points. I'm still going to go through. Well, let's see what's going on over here. Because the quad points there, well, we'll see. I'm just so confused. <laughs> we'll come back over and see. Okay, now we're running along. The good news about encapsulating things like this is that uh, you have a separate node that you can go ahead and debug. Once you debug that, it should work for all the different cases. OK, I have a bunch of family seamless panels. That's looking good. In terms of these points, though, let me take a look at this. What's going on in here? Which quad did you get rid of? The one after quad points. I took it out of the way in terms of getting to the adaptive quad points. It's interesting, though, here, I think that I do still want to flatten it when I take them out there. I'm just sort of guessing. I'm looking ahead. Let me put one more watch in there, and we'll sort of see exactly where this needs to get cleaned up. I'm going to put this watch in over here. I'm going to put it in front of the flatten also. Just because I don't want to fluff through this and really miss something. I want to get exactly the behavior that we want. So let's go ahead and do this again. I'll run this and we'll take a look at this. But it seems like we're getting the right results. I just want to figure out why one needs to be flattened and why one doesn't need to be flattened. Because this list of all of these different quads, these uh, four different points,
things actually sound pretty good. Because I want a bunch of four different points, and then there's like, oh, 30 of them or something like that. take a look at what that actually did. So <coughs> in terms of the result from the quad points, there actually is a separate list. It's rows and columns. Oh, I see. I don't know. In terms of the quad points, It should take four points, but that's what I'm a little wondering about this in terms of the way this happens here. Yeah, you know, we're taking it out there, but I think this is a little strange. I would think that really, I want them to be groups of points, adaptive component points. Now, I'm, I'm just actually, I'm a little confused right now as I look at this because I tend to think that what you always want to have is you want to feed it groups of four points. So I think you would want to actually kind of feed it the flat list. So, this I understand I got the points. I got all these different points, but it's basically groups of points and then within rows. And I just want to flatten that out. That I get because I don't really care about the row structure anymore. This is kind of strange though in terms of coming here. I'm not sure why removing that's actually helping us there. Again, yeah, I'll leave it be for now, because that's not the point we're getting into right now. But it's uh, I understand why yeah, this is basically has groups of four points, and what's happening here is there's basically a group of four points for each of the different rows, and then all is in there. So the way we did it outside of the custom node was we would take that, and we would take all those four points, and then we would flatten that. But not sure why that's actually working right there right now. But again, I'll do some bugging on that. Don't worry about that for right now. That's like a... Uh, Let's come back out here, because this is the part you need. We have a list of some seamless panels. We have a list of these different points. These seamless panels that are hanging around out here, they're actually doing OK. They're kind of hanging around all over out there. The quad points is another one. So here's this list of all these different quad points. And let's see if we can make some sense out of this. So here's the idea. We got this big old list that has all these like quadded points. So I think we have little collections of four XYZ points. We went zipping all the way down there. There's probably like 30 of them or something like that. Actually, there's 100 and 11. Because I have a lot more than I think. Oh, because I have 8 by 14. OK, that makes sense. So here's what we can do. What I want to go through and do is create some surfaces or create some best fit polygons. So the surface looks like this. If I go through and take those points and I say, basically, let's make a polygon out of those points, then I'll make a surface. Okay. What I can do is basically take that surface and really divide it up into the point by point partway between there. So the point by point, UV surfaces are always working on this notion of you know, 0 to 1 being the full extents in both directions. So 0.5.5 is basically saying, give me something right at the center point of it. OK, so let's take it on down here. I'll take these. I made a polygon out of those points. So if I come over here and look at there, there's a whole list of polygons. Then I have a whole bunch of surfaces made from each of those. Then what I'm going to do is basically figure out for each of those different surfaces, what is the point that's right there. I can also figure out 
basically what is the normal at that point. So that would be surface normal at that parameter. So what this first one's going to do is give me just basically the x, y, z coordinate in the center. The second one, surface normal at the parameter, is going to take that surface and at the 0.5, 0.5 point, it's going to project as normal. And I think you can already start to see them there. there are these little guys that are hanging around over there. Little teeny tiny arrows. Let's go and run this. Take a look. Okay. If I look at the points, there's a whole bunch of X, Y, Z points. They're just kind of hanging around out there. That's where these normals are going to be computed. If I look at the normals, let's take a look at them. You'll see that there's all these different normals. They have a length that's one. Okay, X from surface is direction one. They have this whole notion of an X, Y, and Z. And notice what goes on in here. There's something a little bit strange happening. They all have a length of one, but if you look at the Z's, you'll see some of them are flipped. Some are going down, some going up. Now, again, yeah, if anyone could sort of figure out the math behind all that, and this sort of vexes a lot of people, you know. Uh, How is it negatives on some of them, and not the other ones? Because they're all clearly positive. It should clearly all be positive, <laughs> but somehow the math does something strange to you. So. I do that one of those, if you can't beat them, sort of fix them sort of strategy, where if, okay, if some of these are negative, what I want to do is just basically test to see, what I said was, hey, if any of your z's are negative, let's just go ahead and flip the vector. And flipping the vector means take your x component by times negative 1, y, okay, flip them one, negative 1 in each direction. So that's what my little function over here, all normals, point upward does. But Let's stop over here. Do people have the same sort of some z's are negative and some z's are positive? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're getting that, let's take a look at this function ever so briefly. We'll say all normals are all normals point upward. I'm going to take a plane vector. And basically, I'm going to say, okay, for those vectors, there's components. There's vector.z, vector.x, and vector.y. Okay. So what we're testing first is, is the dot z less than 0? That's going to give you a true or false. Okay. If it's true that it's less than 0, I'm going to go through and do the flipping, where the flipping is multiplied by negative 1 on the x, y, and z. So this code block is sort of a really compact way of doing two different things. Actually, that's four different things. It tests true or false. It multiplies the x, y, and z values by negative 1. I make a new vector. So if it's true, I use the new vector. If it's false, I just pass through the old vector. OK, so a little utility function for flipping it. Let me pause just there for a second. Does that sort of make sense? OK. We'll play around with that. Yes? How, how does the first one include the if statement? Is it just? Is that just like implied with how the code block reads it? Oh, no, with the, the first value of the code oh, block is true. Oh, because it goes over there. True, yeah. It, yeah. And, and then sort of the true path and the false path. Yeah. Okay. So let's take this out. Check this out. We have our panels over here. We're going to take all those normals and say, hey, let us go through and take those normals, and I'm going to point them all upward. So what that's going to do is just for all the ones that had the negative z's, it just flipped them all around. So now they all have positive z's. Let's go ahead and we're going to play the game with the sun too, because on the sun side, we're going to say the sun settings are wherever they are. Okay, we have a sun direction vector. I'm going to normalize that vector. That again just reduces the length from 100 to 1. So it's got the length of 100, now it's 1. 
And now I have these two different sets of vectors. I have a single vector over here pointing to the sun. I have all of these different vectors pointing off each of the different panels. What I'm going to do is do the dot product between the two. And that should give us a whole bunch of different numbers. So let's check it out. I'm going to say, uh, let's get all the ones that point normal or upward. Get all the one, the single one that's normalized from the sun. And I'll calculate that. Let's check it out. So in this list now, I got a bunch of values. Now these aren't too bad. You can sort of see all sorts of things. I even have some negative values in there. Let's talk about that. The ones that are very, very close to one, the 0.9s, 0.94s, they're pointing almost directly at the sun. Okay. The ones that are sort of close to zero are sort of pointing, oh, this uh, kind of perpendicular. There actually are some negatives in there. Don't be frightened by that. That just means that if the sun's pointing down, the panel's pointing that way, it's an obtuse angle. So it's kind of pointing away from the sun. Okay, that's okay. So I got a whole range of values in there. And right now, there's some negative values or some positive numbers. Okay. If I wanted to try to go through and do a little scaling, though, here's what I can do. Okay. Yeah. I like to think about these things as having a value of 0 to 1 or 0 to 255 or something like that, something I can map into a color scale, something like that. So what you can do is just sort of say, um, let's say, for example, we were going to like put them on a scale of like 0 to 1. What I could do is just basically take those, which go from negative to positive, and map them to 0 to 1. That's just going to go through and scale them again so that the lowest negative is going to be 0. The highest one will be rescaled to 1. So if I run this, Okay, now I have a whole bunch of values, just going anywhere from 0 all the way to 1. That's the worst one right there. Okay, so I have an evaluation now, and based on this evaluation, I can do things. I can come back over here, and I can take those panels and uh, open something up or close something up based upon what the strength of the value is. I can say anything that has a value above a certain threshold, I'll add a solar panel to. If it's below the, th the threshold, I won't have a solar panel to it. Now, a real simple thing, though, is to just sort of do colors. So let's just kind of show you what that looks like really quickly as you're heading out today. It looks like this. Basically, I got a whole list of panels. You know, I created those panels. Where are they? They're up there. Okay. And what I would like to do is do that element override color in view. So I'm going to say element dot override color in view. And so I'm going to take all these panels and bring them across. Now, you might say, OK, I got these values from 0 to 1, and I want to map them to colors. What can I do with that? So here's what you can do. A real simple way that we do a lot is we create something called a color range. And a color range just gives a value at the low end, a value at the high end, and what the numeric values that should map to those should be. And we can sort of use that to map these. So we'll say, like, color.range. Oh, where's range? It's not dot range, it's just color space range. Thank you. There it is. Check that out. Okay. This is the best looking note I've ever seen. You like that note. Okay, so let's talk what you do with it. You're going to say color.argb by ARGB, right there. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to give it a color. For example, a good color that we might want to use is like pure red. Pure red is 255 with zeros on the others. Okay. We're going to give it another color. 
which is like pure blue. So I'm going to take that and give it 255, but this time I'll do it to pure blue. Okay, so I got pure blue and pure red right there. Okay, so here's what I, how this works. If you take a list of colors, list create, and I'm going to take red and blue. So going blue at the low end and red at the high end. Those are my colors. Okay. Now what I got to do is say, hey, what are the numbers, the indices that are associated with that? So if I want that to go 0 to 1, what I'll do is I'll feed that basically a whole string that's 0 to 1. The way that works as a code block, just the quickest way, is 0, comma, 1. That's a list that has two things in it, 0 and 1. So what this is going to do is it's going to match blue, the first item in the color list, to the first item in this list. So blue is 0. Red, the second item, is going to match the 1. Okay. So now we're going to take these values. How do we do the 0, comma, 1? It's a it's curly a bracket. Oh. Little curly cue bracket. So what I can do now is take all of these fabulous numbers and feed them in there. And when you run this, you'll see you get a range that goes from blue to red. And at the same time, it's going to go through and give us the colors that correspond to each of those. So what we're going to do is take these colors and the element color override view, and as opposed to using those image values, we're going to use those to override the color. So the indices provide, so you have to feed it values that are within the indices. Correct. So you say I want a 0 to 1, and then you feed it values 0 to 1. Yeah. That's what the color range wants. Yeah. I think if you had said 0 to 1 and you gave it 5, it'll probably just go to 1. It'll just go to the extreme end. It's just kind of like looking up in there. So I'll take the colors and put that there. Okay, so when you give that a big run, and you run, uh oh, didn't like it. Oh no! Let's see what it says. One or more of the types are not right. Thanks. I need to flatten that. Oh look, they're all, yes, correct. Now see, they're all, see, that's, that's the that whole thing. Uh, I'm definitely sort of uh, messed up in here. Okay, let's say flatten, uh, not that. No, because they're, they're in an array. Take care. I can list flatten it too. Let's flatten that. That's where I think I need that flattened, but I'm gonna figure out why it broke in the other in the other node. Take that there. Yeah. I got a flat list and some flat colors. So you get something that looks like that. Which is pretty nice. So the nice thing about this, if you want to test it, doesn't it look good? <laughs> I'll turn that to automatic if you want to, and then I can say, how about, what if it's 10 in the morning instead? And it should rotate it over. It's going to do it, and now the red is on the other side. So what it's giving you is this nice, smooth gradation. Bright red is the most direct. Blues are the least direct. The purples just kind of the range of values between there. So I'm just getting some nice color feedback to help you sense. And this is kind of the very typical we're going to be doing a lot of from here on out is we're going to create surfaces and we're going to evaluate them. And that's based on whatever we evaluate them, we need to color feedback or we can adapt their behavior. Either one, so that they always respond to things in the environment around them. Super. Is there an ingredients function? So what? Take care. Is that it? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Nurse. Do you have anything else to say? No, we're going to finish up, but you're asking a good question. Is there a radiance one that I can...
give it like well, it says like clear sky irradiance basically instead of having to map it to a range. What we're gonna do is there's another one, there's something I should really compute the solar insulation. Okay, based on the sky values. Okay, it's to be much more accurate. Because this is like just a first order approximation, just directness. So we're gonna look at this other one. It's really Oh, it's, it's like, it's the basic solar evaluation or something like that. But within that, there's a little more you have to kind of put into it. But one of the things you do is get to go through and, you know, put in values about the sky. And then you can go through and figure out which values you want to pull out. So what do you got to get it? Relative humidity, cloudiness. In this case, it's just funny sky stuff. But I don't know. We'll play with that next time. That's actually where we're going. It's just like solar radiation. This is sweet because if you can, if you can plug this into, like, Go to 2.2 .2 or something like that, and we have a feed in and out. You can be able to calculate like generation potential and you know basically the loads, the loads you have as well. Calculate the heating loads, cooling loads, all at the same time. You do like <coughs> solar forecasting, then you can optimize you know like pre cooling or like energy storage, you know, all kinds of stuff. See, this is really you're heading in the right direction. You can compute all that stuff and do the analysis. Then we can start looking at a lot of different, slightly subtle alternatives for the facade and sort of start comparing them. Yeah, some of this though I'm like trying to figure out how it's relevant because, yeah, it's cool in here to be able to adjust the apertures based on the sun, but unless you have very dynamic objects in a building, like that's not gonna do much good because most of it's more discreet, right? It's oh, exactly. Like so it lines up, with it lines down. I, guess, I mean, it's not, not necessarily true. I guess you can have an automatic, a yeah. building automatically do it. But yeah. So it's really just predicting the behavior. If you sort of said that the building had the sensors, so it always did the smartest thing with the shades. What hey, take care. What would it look like? And then you can at, at least model that. Yeah. But then what you, where this starts to get you is then the ability, OK, given that you can do that to the building facade, what is the best shape of the building or the best shape orientation of the building to even though, you know, to maximize yeah. your potential given the fact that you have a dynamic facade? Yeah. yeah. So. I, got, I got one other question. What's that? Do you remember this is way out, out the subject of this class. But that? Do you remember in, I don't know, we, I'm thinking back to last quarter when we were doing Revit to, Revit to uh, eQuest. Yes. Do you remember, is it easiest to put in like HPC zones or spaces into Revit and do super simple geometry and export to Dota 2? Or do you want to do that in eQuest? I forgot. Oh. I don't know. That, that I, don't know. I, yeah, I, knew, I was just like, taking a shoot while it gets just yeah. to figure out everything. I don't remember reading that by the dimension. I'm trying to figure out what it's about. <laughs> okay, let us adjourn for the day and we will continue. So watch out for some office hours. I'll come to you later this afternoon or tomorrow, pretty much any time in the afternoon.